Okay. Yes. Hello from uh, New York City. My name is Frank Henschke and I run the Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown at the City University of New York a Public Institution of Learning. I am honored to have been invited by Milo to take part in this School of Resistance where learning and unlearning is taking place and where different viewpoints coexist next to each other in a public arena. And many thanks to the Berlin Academy of the Arts for hosting this significant and meaningful event in the time of Corona. In the search of strategies of resistance, Milo Rao, the IIPM, the International Institute of Political Murder and the National Theater of Ghent founded 2020, a globally networked school of resistance as a live stream debate series. A symbolic institution of the future, it has now come to the Academy of the Arts in Berlin and drawing on previous projects, examines aesthetic practices of resistance. Artists and activists discuss art as a transformative reality creating practice. And I hope one day this school mm -hmm. will also come to New York City. We need that. Milo Rao and the IIPM have been working on the contradictions of global capitalism for almost 15 years through installations, <laughs> and political interventions. The intervening of activism in art leads to an expansion of artistic strategies and at the same time contributes to dissolving the boundaries of the concept of art. How can art react to the state of crisis? How can it contribute to strategies of resistance? Six cinematic works by Milo stay in the center of this investigation in these five days. The last days of Ceausescu, the Moscow trials, which will be today, the General Assembly, the Congo Tribunal, Orestes and Mosul, and the New Gospel, his latest work. In doing so, the School of Resistance at the Academy of the Arts examines the conditions of global art productions and the strategies of IIPM itself. Planned before but during the pandemic, the School of Resistance aims to facilitate encounters for experts of change from the arts, research and activism. As a symbolic institution of the future, it is decentralized, networked, global, interdisciplinary, intergenerational, and intersectional by nature. Alike in school, we are engaged in learning and probably more importantly in unlearning notions and practices. In exchanging perspectives, we put our convictions at a stake, at risk, and we put them on the line. Ultimately, we aim to create a growing archive and a repertoire of aesthetic strategies of resistance against the oppression and the suffering in the world. And uh, now I would also like to welcome our uh, great uh, distinguished panelist next to Nilo Milo, who of course does not need any um, uh, introduction. We have with us uh, Juliane Rebentisch, and uh, she's the professor of philosophy and aesthetics at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Offenbach, the uh, School of uh, Design in Offenbach. And she has been a member of the faculty at the Frankfurt Institute of Social Research since 2014. She was a vice president of the uh, HFG Offenbach from 2014 to 2020 and president of the German Society for Aesthetics from 2015 to 18. Her most recent publications are Theories of the Present and Aesthetics of Installation. Andreas Fiel is a director and screenwriter. He's considered one of the most distinguished representatives of the political engaged art. He develops his own screenplays and films for cinema and re has received over 50 national and international awards. In addition, Fiel writes and directs for the theater, including Theater Basel, Schauspiel Stuttgart, Gorky Theater and the Deutsches Theater in Berlin. His plays and productions have toured to numerous places, including Theater Treffen Berlin, and have been translated into more than 10 languages. He is a member of the European as well as the German Film Academy and the Academy of the Arts since 2007. And if we understand right, he is joining us right out of the hospital. He broke an, uh, an arm. Um, the theme of today is, uh, is set by uh, the great French philosopher and political scientist, uh, Jufra de la Gassonnerie, and uh, who will actually join Nilo tomorrow. Uh, for an important one, I think, 
panel who will be moderating tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. So really welcome, welcome um, everybody. And uh, now my question to Milo, uh, Milo, Impossible Art, um, tell us a little bit more about uh, the idea for this panel, what uh, Jufra has in mind. This, this, this beautiful and extensive introduction and hello Andres uh, again and of course Juliane together with me on the table here at the Academy of the Arts. Um, actually uh, the name comes from a book that and I will make it short that Geoffroy de la Ganerie, so uh, a long-term friend of mine uh, wrote I think uh, only some weeks ago, published some weeks ago, and I think fast as you are, uh, Frank, you just read it in, 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 a, in an afternoon, as I know you. And <laughs> actually he's tackling, a, you could say, a dialectic contradiction that you have as a political artist that you are producing inside a system, the institutions, the rhetorics and the public of... Uh, uh, and perhaps the, the, the traditions of representations of a, of, a, in, of, a, of a system that you are criticizing at the same time. So you are in a kind of a, in a, in a, in a locked-in syndrome of uh, political art, and that's what Geoffroy calls the impossible art, so that there is a, a decent art, somehow it's impossible by term, because you are always using the language that you are criticizing. And of course, he's asking himself, how can we reflect on it? And of course, the first step is to understand that there is no other art than political art. Even if you are not engaging, you are engaged in non-engaging. So what could be an ethics and then an aesthetics and the reflective aesthetics of being locked in like this? And is there a way out? And if there is not a way out, how do we tackle it? How do we change institutions? And I think we will... Uh, from representation, documentary art, to changing institutions, to produce other ways of representing and, of course, distribution. What we discussed yesterday with Georg Seeslen, how can you distribute films? Where does the production process start? Is it only screenwriting and directing and editing? Or is the distribution of a film and how it is distributed, how it is produced, also part of what you should call political so, of course, we come here back to an old fantasy of, I think, the bourgeoisie to somehow <laughs> liberate the individuum from, from the society it is living in and liberating an art and having an independent art. And uh, I think the question we, we want to, to tackle today, how resistance is possible? Because, of course, uh, like, a, let's say, a postmodern cliché says the resistance is impossible because ac even the act of resistance of revolution is iconic as a, as a, a tactic and as lifestyle in neoliberalism. So, as I say today to Juliane, I don't want to repeat this a bit boring sociology of criticizing the impossibility of being political in neoliberalism, but uh, that's the basis, on, uh, I think, on which we are discussing, we are trying to create solidarity, we are trying to uh, give space to voices that are unheard, we try to, to, to represent the world in another way and to create new institutions. And um, on, on, on that level, of course, the School of Resistance I understand as a live stream, but I also understand, as you said very beautifully, as a way, a school of bringing practice and theory together in unlearned, unknown ways. Because you, for example, would connect with an actor from New York or from the hospital or from Amazonia or from uh, other genres or from, I don't know, even not uh, activists or not artists, but just uh, lawyers or, uh, and so on. So mixing and creating new collectives. So that's what we... What we try to do here, even if we are also a bit locked in the Academy of the Arts um, uh, at the very moment. And that's, I think that's the starting point. So I give uh, again the word to you, dear Frank. Yeah, um, you're right. It's an extraordinary undertaking you started. And, um, and I think Geoffroy's question is uh, quite uh, significant. He also writes, shouldn't we all be ashamed making art? Yeah. Right? poems, uh, doing plays in the face of the brutality of the world. He quotes Sartre, who said, you know, what is literature in the face of a starving child? Um, what does it really mean? And I think we are in a time uh, right now where we have to ask this fundamental question. There was the big shock, uh, uh, perhaps the end of the idea of modern, the modernity is of, of Auschwitz, where all of a sudden it was no longer just going forward. It was back now. Perhaps Corona is the second uh, big shock. And it says, actually, 
we are back in Middle Ages. The virus uh, is uh, coming through us, through our skin, and we have no way to defend it. We were not um, prepared. Um, I remember seeing a, a graffiti in Paris after a Yellow West uh, a protest. Uh, it was beautiful. It said, Le spectacle est fini. So, so the show's over. It was, I think, sprayed on a, on a supermarket, actually, or some office building. Um, and um, so, in a way, it's, it's about doing theater after the end of theater. Or when we back it, Heiner Müller taught us, that, you know, that we are have reached a, a, a certain point of the end. But still, of course, we go on, we we, we negotiate and reinterpret. Um, so, uh, my question to Juliane is, um, Juliane, um, is art uh, impossible? Is it impossible to do uh, uh, um, practice art? Well, I guess it's a bit too fast to say the spectacle is over because it presupposes uh, that there is no such thing like a politics of the aesthetic. Yeah, uh, And yesterday there were a lot of strands in the discussion where, you know, uh, the, the potential of aesthetics was stressed, uh, where uh, the spectacle actually the theater has the potential to expose the logic of law for example so I, i'm a bit hesitant to throw out the baby with the bathwater here um, maybe one can distinguish like two uh, main paradigms one would be uh, along the line of the avant-gardist tradition yeah uh, uh, let's get out of the frame of art let's end the spectacle and let's become something other than art, namely politics. Yeah, and that's a very, uh, um, I don't know, hegemonic, even or dominant idea of what art should be doing right now. So art then should become something like a creative ally or something of activism and become something uh, like, I would say, design. Obviously, when I use the word design, I don't mean design as in producing pretty surfaces or something, but more like on the deep level, the design is always involved in also forming or constituting the uses, usages, the wants and the life forms yeah, in which uh, design intervenes. So it's, it's also, and of course, in the more progressive field of, of, uh, of design, that's taken up politically. So that means, and some of your work can be understood in this direction, I think, let's produce something that is not in the world but should be, like a tribunal, a parliament, world parliament or something like that, and produce a model that then can be taken up and should be become part of reality. Yeah? And can produce reality. And, and can go into serial production, as it yeah. were. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a kind of a design uh, approach. Um, and that obviously has some uh, function and productivity to it, but I think it's somehow doing away uh, uh, with, with the art thing. And it also presupposes, and I would like to talk about that too, that there is something like an, uh, an avant-garde, and that is the creative class. Yeah, that we some, and one could ask, of course, isn't that a chauvinistic and outdated idea that we must look at artists slash designers to uh, to learn something about what is to be changed uh, in the world. So everything, I think, then hinges on how we think the relation of activists and artists here. But coming back to um, my, I don't know, defense of the spectacle in that regard, I would say in Milo's work and the whole debate yesterday, I don't know, to those who were attending uh, the discussions yesterday on the last days of uh, the Torchescos, um, what we have here is a work that is realist in a totally different way and where, art, where art's relation to reality is also thought of differently, namely that uh, nothing in reality uh, uh, stays the same once it's injected into the frame of art. Yeah, So reality changes when it becomes art. And what's in the middle is, of course, representation. So you give an, a realist artist, what does he do? Yeah? yeah, He gives an image of reality, but I would say he gives an image, uh, in the better cases, in such a way that uh, the reality of representation itself comes into the picture as well. 
Yeah. So what uh, what you do, I guess, in the in the film on the uh, the person harvesting tomatoes in South Italy in uh, in uh, as a new Jesus uh, is uh, that you are not only telling another story, but you're also referencing ways of representation of uh, famous Jesus. Uh, stories, yeah. So, so I think it's also, and I wouldn't uh, underestimate the political potential of that uh, reflection on the ways in which we imagine or in which we represent uh, reality. Yeah, I think that's an important point, and that's a potential of spectacle, uh, a potential, uh, nevertheless, that from the perspective of politics uh, might look like a weakness. Yeah, that everything once it's re injected into the frame of art, somehow is tinged by the as-if character of art. Yeah? So, so even people who are lawyers in real life, once they are on stage with Milo, they are also becoming actors of their own life, of their own position. But this kind of distancing that happens also has a specific politics uh, to it. And I think these two lines are somehow sometimes running up against each other, sometimes in an interesting relation uh, to each other. So that's my longish answer <laughs> to your very Thank big you. question. Thank you. That, that is important. And uh, I, I do agree. We, we do need um, the, the idea of the spectacle, the theater, or the performance, or the intervention, or something appearing on a space what uh, people um, are watching. Andras, um, you are a, a filmmaker, your films also restage uh, uh, or, or create in a documentary style a discussion on ecology, on the big questions of our time. How do you see Milo's work? What does it mean to you? Well, um, there are a lot of parallels in a way, because the way uh, he intervenes is very familiar in terms of, let's see the, the example tonight of the Moscow trials. I just uh, in a way, stage trial, something what will happen in the future, ecocide. Germany is sued by 31 nations, uh, 2034, because of uh, the negligence of uh, climate targets and the way how they blocked uh, climate targets in the last 20 years. So uh, by giving something like an example, like modeling uh, reality, uh, something like an uh, inducement or an impulse is in the world. We just show uh, by modeling reality, by giving many people a chance to create something which has this, uh, this kind of impact, something uh, will happen. So I'm strongly, I'm a strongly believer uh, so in the impossibility of possible art, um, when I think back of my very, very first experience, I was a student in psychology. I went to the psychiatry in prison uh, just for an internship. And I, I just uh, was asked, well, do something creative with these people. And they were locked in for 24 hours in small cells. And uh, so I just observed them and they s suddenly they started something. They were painting and some were doing extinguishing cigarettes on the hands of uh, the other inmates, very cruel things. And I just created something with these people and suddenly there was such an energy. And when you read all the reports, you read a lot about the lack, what the people are incapable, they're aggressive, they're dangerous. And I just tried to find out what is the potential. And, and that's uh, a question of the human being. If we believe in the potential of human beings, if we don't believe in, in the lack and all the, the incapabilities, incap uh, then we have a starting point. Uh, so we empower people to think about their own situation. We empower people to create uh, an expression of themselves. We empower people uh, to go beyond their own uh, way of thinking. So in a way, we are just more or less like a medium for empowerment. And this was such a strong experience because I was 25. I didn't believe in art at all. 
I just did something and uh, then the, the ward came or all the, the doctors and they said, you do horrible things. People get so excited. So we have to give more pills to calm them down. And I knew, okay, that's it. That's resistance. We start just with empowerment. And of course, the system strikes back by giving more pills, by calm them down. But uh, it was the first step. And it was for me something like a clue of experience. I said, okay, this is the way. It's a question of believing in the capabilities of people, believing in the possibility of change. And the institutions, of course, they are as they are. And it takes years. And I knew after two years, they kill me. And uh, they killed me in a way they threw me out and uh, I was sacked. But anyway, I had two years to do something. And maybe after me, somebody else is coming, changing something. Yeah, that is an important uh, notion of the possibility. I think if I remember right, Juliana wrote uh, in her book that um, there should be an understanding of art in the light of its very best possibilities, what it could and can do. So my question to Milo. Um, can I just also... to, to, to bring back the idea to Milo? Because the, the idea when I say modeling, what Milo did in, in the Moscow trials, I only could watch the fir first 30 minutes because of the uh, Wi-Fi in the hospital. <laughs> it's quite low. Yeah. Anyway, institution. But, uh, so, uh, but even watching the first 30 minutes, what I saw is in a way a process of healing. Uh, he showed something which could be the right way to deal with it. It's not reality. We know it. And in a way, my model in, in the last film, Ecoside, this trial in the future, Germany is sued by 31 nations, is a model which now many people, I get so many notions, so many comments, that's the way we have to deal it. So many people uh, in the law sector, in the legal system, just went uh, and called me and said, okay, you, you described a model which could be not in... 14 years, but maybe in one or two years, we will go for it. So it's in the world. We have to bring something into the world, some oxygen into the world. And uh, if we are lucky and we are not always lucky, I failed many, many times. I, we can, we have maybe to talk a little bit more about the failure, not about the success. But in this case, I can say it is a success, success because we, we the, the ideas in the world and some people grab it and develop it. So art is this little oxygen in the engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you're doubting I, it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, my, yeah. I think there's more oxygen. <laughs> yeah, my question to you. Um, of course, art is uh, the, in, in the imaginary, yeah, in the symbolic, but also in the real. Your school of resistance, your work. Is it symbolic? Uh, you all say it's a symbolic. Uh, uh, institution, but is it symbolic or is it uh, uh, intending to real change? No, I think the first try is always symbolizing a normalization or kind of introducing uh, or designing a possible normalization of the act that is only possible in an artificial framework on a stage. You know, the first parliament is staged and then it becomes normalized and then you would vote all four years and it becomes part of social life. A ritual that you wouldn't question anymore and even not remembering as, a, as an introduced and a kind of invented, you know, uh, ritual. So this is, this, is, this is quite interesting and that's why for me, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, an artwork that is interesting for me has two sides. And not, I, I, there is even failure and failure, but I think it's important that you show the process, how it was produced in the work itself. So for me, that's an ethical point that you could see the making of while you see the framework and you even see at the same time what this framework, this design produces. But you see all the failures by doing it, perhaps even the pressure you have to do on some people that says, but no, no, I don't want to be, uh, take part in this design. I'm perhaps uh, more interested in this one or that one. The, the difficulties of solidarity to... to to make a kind of a, of, a, of a frame together to function in a in a symbolic space, uh, which is very very difficult. For example, the, the the Jesus film for me was the biggest difficulties was not uh, 
to make a Jesus film, because everybody who is not completely brain dead can do a Jesus film, of course. You <laughs> give uh, costumes to people and then you have the Bible and that's it, you know. But the difficult yeah. thing is to bring together 42 groups of different people that is kind of, of programmed to fight one against the other to not change the situation. Because, I mean, one thing I learned, and it's a sad truth, that the slave doesn't want to make a revolution, he wants to be master, you know. So to bring together people to say, let's do revolution, or we could uh, call it now to, to make more simple art together, engaged art together is normally 50% at least against what is logical to do in the system they find themselves, or I find myself as an, as an artist too. So it's kind of, it's contraintuitive and it's intuitive what we do. And I think to show these difficulties of this process to have a solidary act of, 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 of art is one point. And the other point for me is really the reproductive thing that we don't represent and duplicate reality, but we create a place where things become real and reality is produced, you know? Sometimes violent realities, sometimes reality of dissent, but sometimes also utopic realities. And that's what I mean with symbolizing. I, I mean, there's in Goethe, perhaps you know that better than me, Juliane, as a, as a professor, but Goethe has a, an idea of the symbol, for example. In the, in the theory of Goethe, it's not a symbol in a way how we understand it uh, in, in, in common language, that it is something that is somehow not real. It's something that is, at the moment when it appears, it's real but it's symbolizing reality and it is reality. And this for me is the double face of, of, of documentary art, you know? And I would call the documentaries that, that uh, Andres is doing and that uh, I am trying to do too, uh, uh, utopic documentaries. So kind of inventing a situation and then filming that situation as you would documenting it. So a very strange, and perhaps that's all about art, that you would kind of, the, 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 the different regimes of fiction and, 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 and documentary art all the time try to bring together, to find a place where fiction changes into reality and reality is refictionalized and is opened again, you know? And this is a process to the future, but it's also a process to the past. You can have also a utopic view on the past. When we are talking about resistance, we have so many examples of resistance against capitalist society that are forgotten, that is untold, that is, you know, and if you go in history books of 19th century, 18th century, 17th centuries of other cultures, you will find so many past things that are not revealed. So the past is unwritten, the future is unwritten, and I think art is a kind of a totalization of the present moment where Past and future, I mean, now it becomes a bit, a bit uh, mystic uh, meat <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but in reality, and not just because we are talking about it or, or writing a beautiful poetry, but as, a, as an act of, 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 of common creation. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. if I might, may step in, I think uh, I'm just interested in asking back to both uh, you and Andres uh, about the relation of the participatory work you're doing yeah. with uh, people that has empowering potential, maybe th therapeutical uh, um, potential, a healing potential. That's what something uh, A.I. Weizmann brought up yesterday in reenactment, for example but also empowering people to be uh, creative, to unfold uh, or express uh, their uh, potentialities. But um, this is only one side. Yeah? So you can invent forms for this, but then there is a secondary audience yeah, to whom this is uh, documented and then shown. Yeah. And I'm wondering also f with regard, especially to your work in uh, Belgium and your work in the Congo, mm. like how, I mean, the, the whole like ethical point for the second audience is how do they come into the picture? How do you prevent them from just consuming politicality? No? To come back to our uh, initial uh, mm. question, how do we prevent, uh, like, um, since it is pretty obvious that we're living in a time in which bourgeois society comrade right <laughs> is uh, pretty eager to uh, to 
um, have art be political. Yeah? yeah, and this has a whole set of you know not so nice uh, ideas. One or c can come to mind like is it delegation? Yeah, from from uh, the political realm to the cultural realm. Yeah, that art shall be political right now. Is it has it a compensational function? Yeah, uh, and all these kinds of questions come up. So. So my, I, I have somehow um, I'm a bit nervous with uh, with the second audience, and I think with the two politics I described uh, in my uh, first statement, the second one, namely the one that questions uh, representation, the reality of representation, might also be a means of you know making the audience reflect on their own habits of what they had in the bourgeois institution of theatre. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess, yeah, I guess my question to both of you back is: How do you think of these, like, first participatory audience, and then the second, uh, the second one too, which is uh, the the first production is played back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you want to start? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so many items uh, <laughs> you mentioned. I I try to be short. Um, First of all, with my last play, we, we tried something which was for me was a new approach because we invited scientists, uh, 13 scientists of uh, different fields, economy, environment, and to develop with the audience in workshops something like a scenarios for the next 10 years. We just said we will have a financial crisis, we have uh, a crisis, of course, of the environment and develop with the participants common to together with the scientists uh, scenarios. And it was a very interesting day because uh, a lot of very different old, young, uh, I don't know, from all over the city and uh, Germany people came and many, many pe more people were interested to come and to join. And uh, there is a necessity to to create something and to think about science, but not in terms of science, which is a loo far away, um, to, to grab it and to integrate it into forms of art. And uh, so it was a common process of writing in a way. So you could say the artists are lazy. We are using scientists and we are using <laughs> Uh, the, the, all the people who joined us uh, to create something, but it was a common experience. Uh, and I was very euphoric in a way, because out of this material we developed something and out of the simple it became real, because after the show we invited uh, politicians in, in a very concrete way and said, okay, what are, this, uh, what are the, the functional ideas? So not a vicious circle, but a circle in terms of a production, production from science to the audience, with the audience, into the theater, from the theater, into politics. So uh, to, to have this kind of uh, empowerment in a very practical way of thinking. And uh, so it, it, it was just one example. And, it, and of course, it's just a little drop in the ocean. But again, it's something uh, I felt this strongness of uh, capability, the strongness of empowerment. And it was something like, like a first little trace to go on in terms of participating experience with science and with politics. And of course, I'm not naive. Uh, we have to think about power structures. We have to think about many, many things that uh, art can do many things. And we are get, we, we all know we are discussing it in the very beginning. We are we're doing impossible art in a way because they just embrace us and kiss us and say thank you. And uh, that was it. So, it, but anyway, it, it was like this little gemstone and uh, we have to the, take care about it and develop it. And I think, uh, Milo, we, you do also a very strong work and um, maybe it's uh, very good to, to have these kind of schools to, to say, OK, there are many, many people all over the world doing something. How can we bring it together that it's not just the drop in the ocean? I think to, to answer to your question for the second, uh, what you call the second public, which would be uh, on the screens and uh, etc. 
So I think there is, uh, I mean, there are very simple movements. Where, I mean, what you, what you described that you would have in the second public uh, kind of people that is already empowered and that can change and that are, for example, politicians or managers of enterprises and etc. And you address these people. More generally, you can also address the consumer society, which are, is consuming a film in the next day, per, uh, as an example from the new gospel, are consuming tomatoes. Because one beautiful thing about capitalism is that capitalism is immoral. So if everybody buys uh, sustainable tomatoes, capitalism will only produce sustainable tomatoes. And if everybody buys tomatoes that are made under the law of mafia, they will only produce this kind of tomatoes. And you, if you make or if you think an artwork as a whole circle of distribution that distributes the dignity <laughs> that you show in the film as something that you could buy later in the supermarket as a tomato brand and as a visitor of the film you can buy these tomatoes and you are informed and perhaps even with the ticket you buy it or already the ticket you buy you can support cinemas that are closed and you don't buy your ticket on Netflix, etc. So these are things we are trying out at the moment. Uh, very simple things to kind of introduce in the distribution, not only watching, but everything is a process of, of distributing. And in the end of the day, to put it on a more uh, theoretical level, I think it's the old question of how to bring what uh, a bourgeois artwork tells you, knowledge, emotion, together with practice, how to link in the process of distributing art a new practice or an artistic practice of the public together with what the artwork is telling you. How do you can become as a, a visitor of the artwork part of what is happening in the artwork, of the revolt of dignity, for example, in the, in the, or in the Congo Tribunal that you could then, what we did with this film, we used this film as a tool to then, uh, with thousand copies, perhaps you talked with Arne Birkenstock about it, uh, that we sent, because we had our last discussion after, I think, the Congo Tribunal, that we then sent to, uh, uh, to many, together with the, with the Assemblée de, uh, of the Lawyers' Assembly of, of, of Congo, we sent to villages that there they are used as a tool to organize trials, completely then independent from even I don't know, being included in any way of distributing art in Europe. It's really kind of a tool. And that's how the book, and very beautifully of Geoffroy, by the way, ends. He said, uh, in bourgeois art and in the art circuit, the art as a methodology, as, a, as an example, as a pedagogy of how you should act is very bad seen. It's not real art, you know? And he said, perhaps we should re-establish this value of art, that art is a school, that you can learn from art how to live better, you know? So this seems very, uh, I know, very humanist now, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Indeed. And uh, what about uh, the negativity of art? I mean... Uh, no, no, absolutely. You know, yeah, the deconstruction of everything. Uh, uh, yeah, Milo, my, my question to you, speaking about the audience, as Juliana mentioned, um, Brecht said he wrote for the children of the uh, technological age. Um, now we could say we have the children of the digital age. You call this the school of resistance. And there's the tradition of the German Bildungstheater, the educational theater. And as Brecht, in a way, followed that, uh, that idea of a Goethe and Schiller, and uh, Rihanna argues actually also Otto did. And are you part of that building starter? Do you think if the future of engagement, the future of resisting, is performing knowledge? It is. Is it a pedagogical institution? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a part. It's a part of institution. I mean, this idea to call it school of resistance came from the landless movement. We were collaborating for Antigone, and what they do, they have their own. I don't know uh, agriculture. They have their own uh, schools. So they made where you learn different things. You can read the Bible, for example, you have, you have uh, courses in religion, but in another way, you have courses in agriculture, but in a sustainable way, etc., etc. And then we started dreaming about uh, another humanist topic, but we are here and, and we talk from, from where we are, from the School of Resistance, to bring together knowledge and how knowledge is connected to practice in different cultures, in different parts of the world together, to, for example, understand that 
If you want, if you, if you need land, you can occupy land. If this land is not used by the landowner, it is, is allowed by the constitution of Brazil. That's what the landless movement is doing million of times. But it would also be allowed in Germany. You could also occupy here. Occupation is legal, you know? So, and this is something you can learn in a, in a kind of a global school of resistance, which you didn't know before. And something very shocking, by the way, of a global school of resistance is that you have structural uh, similarities of structural violence that are extremely the same in everywhere you go in the world. You will understand quite fast that was for me the, I mean, the outcome of all this that we are really living in one world and everything is connected. Everything is really connected. There is no discon there is a little bit of disconnection everywhere, but it's a big, one big, I mean, I'm not paranoid, but it's one big economical cultural system we are living in. And perhaps that's the first generation ever, you know? I mean, uh, I'm a bit uh, concerned with uh, the knowledge paradigm for art, I must say. Um, one often talks like that, you know, art produces knowledge like all other fields, but just in its own way or something like that. And I think that's somehow jumping over uh, a, a potential that art has uh, in its negativity, namely in not producing uh, knowledge or more knowledge or, or better knowledge. Why should the artist be better than a theoretician or a journalist or people who are doing uh, work or in the beginning you says or just lawyers <laughs> uh, or lawyers why shouldn't they uh, uh, produce the knowledge that we need uh, so why art for that but art ca can do something very specific namely uh, put us in a certain relation to our knowledge production uh, which I find uh, where something like below me there's written decolonize the spectacle yeah we have the decolonization of the theater uh, can happen in really playing back uh, the problematic knowledge production that the Bildungsanstalten of the bourgeois theater um, have constituted or co-constituted co and sustained for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this is also connected with new forms of uh, post-colonial you know, work that's I been done both on the practical mm. and the theoretical and the critical level. But the relation of art is not to top them all, to say, okay, they're post-colonial theorists and uh, activists and so on, but our knowledge is the knowledge that we need. It's, I think it's not like that. It's more like uh, also reflecting on the specificities in which uh, that harmful kind of knowledge production um, sits in the very apparatus of the uh, of the European um, theatre yeah and to, yeah, to address that and in a way that is where critical work and aesthetic work yeah. and artistic work come together but I way. think the negativity you are addressing and the positivity I was addressing a bit too naively mm. of course and uh, my artworks are extremely negative you know I know, that. Yeah, I know that. So, but it's uh, I think these two sides coming together then it's something interesting happening because you can, I, I just read yesterday by fun this the long summer of theory where you have all this Adorno chapter and everything is negative and it's impossible to make in this system. It's not no way out, etc. No, yeah, that's a different you know, negativity. Yeah, I know yeah. that's a different negativity <laughs> or even melancholy or depression of, mm. of the intellectual, uh, and it, which is very modern and very postmodern. And then you have another way of saying, okay, if you create I don't know, decolonized uh, frameworks of collectives producing knowledge, there will be produced something that is hyper positive. You know, is not only saying we don't want to have racist violence and again, we don't want to have patriarchal violence again, but that would produce a way of telling stories by accident of people coming together and processes of production that was unforeseen and not foreseen, you know. And this is the kind of knowledge I, perhaps you could even not call it knowledge, because what about would this knowledge be? Mm. Because this knowledge is, is aimed to the future, you know, is to producing yeah. reality. It's not knowledge about uh, a reality that is better than, the, uh, than a scientist and would have. And, and I think uh, it's for me, it's a, a competition of uh, producing knowledge. I, I would say because uh, 
many other institutions who all the time from morning to night produce so-called knowledge, we know they fail. It's just uh, the way in cliches it's repeated and we, we are fed up with it. So I think it's, it's, our, it's our necessity to, to deal with knowledge and not only to show how it is produced, but to put even to produce better aesthetical knowledge, to go beyond the common production of knowledge and um, by maybe sometimes a naive curiosity by asking questions, by listening, uh, going into the system of thinking, of talking, of just uh, observing this system and analyzing it and grabbing the substance out of it and uh, transferring it on, on another level. And uh, I think we can be very successful because we, are, we have a better way of production. We have a better way of research. We have more time than journalists. We have even more time than scientists. We are much more free to bring levels and layer together. And uh, so I won't uh, neglect uh, the, the power of uh, producing knowledge. Yeah, I, I, and I would relate to that and also to what, what Juliane said, that today by accident I had a discussion with a journalist about Pasolini and we were asking ourselves, why do we like Pasolini, the, the, the filmmaker? And what is in his iconography and his way of, of, of filming that we like? And for example, then we found out that we like that the over-shoulder shot is not existing in Pasolini that you have the one and then you have the other and there is not always this dramaturgy of the space, who is where. Or you have, for example, a face watching something and you see everything that this face watches and you don't even see what this face sees, you know? So that there is a kind of a deconstruction or a totalization of images in an archaic way that kind of escapes to this way of capitalism to have an economic of, 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 of telling a story, you know? Perhaps it is boring. Perhaps it's a bit uh, too much Catholic art, whatever. But it can also li lie in this, you know, that you make pictures in another way. <coughs> that you don't have this kind of uh, Schuss gegen Schuss, over shoulder, all this bullshit from television. That you just say no to that. Yeah, but you know? that's what I mean. Like this, uh, like work uh, rep on uh, on conventions of representation, yeah. right? So, so that's, I think. As I said, an, an enormously important aspect of it. Yeah, not just look at the contents and say, "Okay, hey, here's another story," and we might be really uh, like good in researching it and, yeah, and so on. But content is an alibi in art, no? Its content Sorry? is not exist. Hey, for me, content it doesn't exactly. exist. Exactly. So in yeah, art. yeah, so yeah. that's the problem. If you know, people like concentrate on uh, on that. So uh, yeah, exactly. Mm. Frank. I mean, I speak about Pasolini. Uh, what Pasolini said is that we should throw our bodies uh, into life and it's their uh, life is dangerous. And I think what Milo's art also shows uh, that he puts himself also at risk in danger. It's dangerous art, what he does. The Moscow trial, if we see this today, you will see that was dangerous. Uh, the Congo Tribunal, they are dangerous uh, territory he moves in. And why I think his work is important and his school of resistance is that capitalism and the neo-capitalism actually normally uses now the artist as an example why capitalism works. The artist is the model, you know, look at the artist, he has no money and he applies, the actor is rejected all the time, but he believes in himself and then he becomes a star and gets, comes to Hollywood and becomes an all-star. And if you do the same, and he never asks for uh, health insurance, you know, and for wages. Um, and uh, and uh, also Heiner Müller said, theater, why uh, we have to keep in mind is against the machine of theater. Real theater actually sees the representation of the state of the system in the theater itself. And we have to resist, we have to uh, fight against it. It's not the goal to be part of it, it become the master, as Milo said, to get also on Broadway here in America, especially all is about the success. But to say, no, these are different models of producing, they are different values. And it is about inclusion and like kind of, a, as he says, global conscious, you know, to keep in mind the tensions between the reality and, of course, the, the vision. And, and we have, so I think this resistance is uh, of um, significance. So, Milo, uh, uh, your 
dangerous approach in a way? Um, is it uh, calculated? Uh, is it thought out? Or is it natural that it comes to you? Or is it intentional? Um, this brings me to a question I, uh, that is that is projected here in the, in the in the Academy of the Arts because we have the, the questions of the public and it's yeah. completely related to I what guess. you say because there it's a question because of course we don't only put ourselves as the artists into uh, into into danger uh, uh, but also everybody who is working with us and what is the ethical standing point about this because of course when I can say I put me in danger so I don't care and then whatever happens it's it's up to me so that's a uh, I think it, this only depends from the psychology of everybody, uh, how how he how he likes to work more in panic or more more in a quiet way. So that's that's really I, I, you are born like this or like that. But I think what is interesting is um, what happens with and for me the biggest danger of people is not that there is a real danger and it could be a bomb in a car or I don't know or the the Russian secret service could kill us all. For me, the danger is the danger of the representation. And uh, especially when you do documentary work, that you put somebody in a film and you say, this is the real person, this is the real life, that's how uh, she or he is. And uh, I, I, I could talk longly about this ethical problem, how long you can discuss with people until you find the, edit, the way of edited, you know, because you say, okay, you have this role in the film, but at the same time, I know it's not the whole story and... Uh, I had it now when I was working in, in, in Geneva for this opera where we presented 18 people on stage. So what are your four sentences, your 10 sentences? And I know it very well when you give, for example, an interview and then you say, okay, they cut it down, but when is it still real, what you said? You know? And how do you deal? I, I would like to ask this, Andres, because you are uh, somehow even more uh, a real, uh, let's say, documentary filmmaker, especially in your earlier work, than I ever was. How do you deal with the, with the, you know what I mean? With this? Uh, yeah, of yeah. course, of course. <laughs> in, <laughs> in my first film, I had a lot of fight with the actress, with the main actress. Uh, she was attacking me and it's all in the film. But at the same time, I was staging this scene. So it's, it, uh, we were playing with these different layers of representation. And I think um, uh, if this is part of it, or if at least the contradiction of my way of pre pre representation by, for example, in Addicted to Acting, when the, the actors uh, said, well, we are fed up with the way you ask questions, we are fed up uh, with the way you are um, trying to direct us, uh, we are in a documentary, we don't get paid. So this kind <laughs> of... Uh, um, reflection of the process i think it's it's, of, uh, it's it's always a, a a necessity to show it's of course my story in the very end i'm sitting in the editing room as you do uh with katya and then uh, you, <laughs> you make your film editor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is a, a power we have and i think uh, we are the, the storytellers in the very end but uh, we are liable to it liable Just ah, something? yeah, I think he he has a, a problem with the stream, huh? Yeah, he's right. Uh, Frank, is... now, I can tell you the, oh, the, the most the most challenging work for me in a documentary is not preparing the film, is not researching the film, is not shooting, is not editing. The most challenging work is when the film is finished, because then I pay for it. Then I have to deal with the protagonist and tell him, look, this is my story and you are part of it. So do you accept it? You fight me, you hate me till the end of your life. And it happened and that's his failure. And we have to talk also about failure because uh, I failed a lot. I really used my power. I used my strength and I made my film and I paid for it and the protagonist paid for it. And uh, so it's a, it's a high price. Because the actor has the protection of the role and the pro protagonist, normally they true. don't get paid and don't, they don't have protection.
um, yeah, so there, there is, a, is a price to pay. If art has a value, it has a price there because there is the market. And Julian, a question for you as someone who really uh, monitors contemporary art yeah, across the fields and across the uh, this. What is the art we do need? What do you think uh, at the moment, what we are in? And, uh, uh, Time guys, as you say, you know, that, that invention, that we come to the help of the time we happen to be in. Um, what do you think are the marks? What are the things you talked about, the open artwork like Echo or works and movement also, but what do you think is contemporary art what we need most? That's for you, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, I don't know whether I can answer this uh, question. I think there are still so many different things happening at the same time um, that uh, I think uh, it is worth like doing something like we are doing now, namely take a close look on what we are doing as in the fields of practices uh, that aim at the full weight of art, yeah, uh, at uh, the uh, at, at look at its own social and political dimension and uh, yeah, look at the different uh, models there are and the different strands that run up even in one singular piece as to my mind is often the case in your work, Milo, and, uh, and discuss them. Yeah? So I wouldn't say or propose, a, I think that also would be a false role if a critic came up with uh, a to-do list or something. I would like so I would, No, but I think, um, you know, uh, to come back to the question of uh, form of representation, to the violence of representation, you were talking about that yesterday, and also Andres was just talking about that, that of course, to cut, making cuts of, in a film and to cut away uh, uh, certain bits and pieces of the material is also a violent process. So you have to stand up for your decision. And the question is, how uh, do we deal with that? And what kind of ethical... So that's for me already a whole big uh, book that we are opening up here. So what's this relation of uh, camera uh, towards the person being on camera? Yeah, What do we aim for? Are we aiming for the, the true moment? And is the true moment also one in which uh, the person stays opaque, yeah, where the opacity of the person is part of the truthfulness, uh, for example. Uh, um, I think that's also in the Pasolini, like, like the way that the camera is not overseeing the scene, is not producing a transparent uh, image, but something that somehow uh, is not so easily consumable because there is, a, is an opacity of the camera vis-a-vis -vis the actors. Yeah, so this whole theme, to describe that in detail, uh, for me is already uh, uh, a big uh, question. The, of course, the ones that we had before, like what's the relation of art and knowledge? Of course, I didn't want to play off, you know, the, the, um, the production of different stories against uh, the negativity of reflecting on the conventions of such uh, stories. I think they go uh, hand in hand, but I think it's more like from from my observation also of the art discourse that I feel I have to stress the second aspect so much. Yeah, yeah because uh, people like, feel like, okay, art is about knowledge projection. It should become something like uh, criticism. And uh, in the content, it, it has to be research and so on and so forth. Should be like another form of knowledge. Then I would say, okay, there we're losing a lot if we are subscribing to to this, I don't know, unbalanced stress of this aspect. Mm. Yeah. So that's why I'm always saying, okay, there's something like a politics, not only of form, but also of negativity, uh, that is there also, and I would defend that normatively, since you'll be asking <laughs> of normative judgments, uh, they are, in my case, pretty much committed to this uh, negative side as well. And if we lose that, I would say, okay, then, then maybe, uh, you know, something that is, of course, super important work, yeah, educational work, uh, et cetera, but that's not specific to art. So that's also a question that always is with me, uh, when do we call something art when, or when not? Yeah. Yeah, 
I, I, um, because I see another uh, question from the public. Yeah, uh, we have we have some comments, and I think it's very closely linked to it. The question is, I, I sum it up a bit because it's it's quite long. Um, is it possible to produce in the distribution production systems VR, where there is an artist from Europe, for example, and people that has no uh, regularization in South Italy, immigrants, without even papers or names, can they work together in a way that it is not only post-colonial but decolonial, in a way that they would be really empowered in a structural way? Can art bring structural change when people with structural power and people with that are structurally powerless come together? And it is questioned and uh, it said no, I think it's impossible. The, 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 this, this commentator says, and I think it's for me that's an ex expression I can very well understand. It's it's perhaps the melancholy of of Western Europe somehow uh, to make this statement. What I made many times uh, the experience in art that you can change structurally and only in bits, and that's what I call the positivism of art, and where I insist, uh, uh, even if. I completely follow you, mm. Juliana, in, in uh, what I like as an artist and what I mainly do. Even if I only add 1% of positivism, I would 99% I would edit and think about the light, you know, and about the reality of the emotion and the, the Brechtian levels and whatever. So, I mean, that's my work. But still, to take again the new gospel, what happened, hundreds of people now have papers. They have a house because we invested in it. We want to change the laws. We want to have a tribunal. It's for serious. We want to change. And I think it's a necessity that the people with structural power, like everybody who is in this panel, united as, as in the education apparatus, like you with an institution, like you as a very known uh, director, Andres, we have to use these possibilities. We have to change to decolonize. I think it's really, it's, 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 uh, it's, this is very serious. I think it's really important that we use this positive power of art. That doesn't mean that we, you know, that we completely forget what, what is the, the, I don't know, the, the complexity of the, of the, of the, and we have to reflect on, uh, and we, we try in my way, in my funny way, perhaps doing it in the new gospel that you see that when activists and artists come together, what sometimes happens that it doesn't work for both sides, it's a failure. Yeah, but still we have to try, we have to believe in it and we have structurally to use the production money and the production power we have to change structurally the situation of the people that is at least included in our films or in our projects. And uh, it never really works out, perhaps it's 10 people, perhaps it's 20 people, but we did it and we do it and we continue doing it. And I, I just want to underline it because this is it possible that uh, somebody from Western Europe would ever not only repeat the exploitation system but change it. I think it is possible to change it. We see it in the history of, of I don't know, even of our own continent. Uh, what happened, I mean, the liberation of all minorities, etc., etc. You know what I'm talking about. I don't go in these details, but it happens all the time. And it's really yeah, possible. Yeah. And I think uh, what you say, maybe we are just not more than catalysts. So uh, by in the very beginning, we 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 create something like uh, the symbol of our work. It becomes some sort of reality, and then it's transferred. What I call the oxygen, uh, and sometimes it's very small. Uh, I I remember a crucial scene for me. I, I showed uh, a play. Uh, in in the province of Brandenburg and we had a debate afterwards and in the beginning it was about the play but then it was suddenly it switched nobody was interested in me anymore in me as an artist and I was totally unimportant the play was unimportant but the people in the audience hall were talking about their situation about the situation of experience of right extreme Terror, terror, everyday terror by violence, by people getting beaten up, etc., etc. And people that in the very end exchanging emails, they built a group, and I was standing aside. Nobody was talking anymore to me. Nobody was uh, asking for autographs. Nobody was just saying bravo, what you did. 
I was just <laughs> no, <bravo. laughs> totally unimportant. And yeah. it was the best experience, I tell you. It was the best experience because uh, we all, I am, of course, somebody who needs success and he, who needs good critics sometimes. And he, <laughs> I want to get love all the time. But uh, this experience that I was <laughs> just unimportant, it was so great. It was such a relief. I knew that's the way we have to be catalysts in the very beginning, then the process, the symbol becomes reality and we are out of the game. They have to take over, not not us. Yeah, as we took over so many times, you know, Andres, I think I took over so many times. Everything I'm doing in my films was made by somebody else. I'm kind of collecting the symbols of others and the practices of others. I'm, I'm uh, you know, so it's, yeah, it's passing through. That's true. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then we go to the next spot and doing the same thing. And then we are unimportant. We can go throw our pieces out of art, out of the window. Boys, uh, it's a quotation of boys. Throw my piece of art out of the window. And that's very good. So no museums, no installations for the end of the society and civilization. No, we just do it in this very moment. And then we do it and then it's over and it's gone. And we, we have to go to another place and try again yeah well i mean uh i think it's uh obviously uh one demands of progressive art making that it has an eye of the materialistic uh preconditions um of this and to uh turn that not not let your production just be determined by it from the back but turn it into material itself uh, and somehow expose it and work on it but of course the productions within uh for example theater are connected to larger structures yeah. that you uh you can show Uh, but not change alone. So this is where, you know, uh, an individual artwork runs up against uh, larger structures where you need a political movement <laughs> or where you need something else than, than art. Yeah, And that's, I think, also important to have in mind. And I come more in my reflection from the visual arts. And in that field, uh, there is also a problem with, you know, we insert our little bombs and then we move on to the next uh, space. That's been the structure of the biennials and, uh, and so on, where, um, where somehow the question of time and sustainability is uh, totally key. So uh, I think that's not trivial to think of this relation of of course, aiming at what you can ha what you can control and uh, to turn that also into something that can be discussed and uh, turn that into something that informs the artwork on the deep level. Yeah? But also to be very clear about uh, what art somehow cannot do, where the institution of art is around it, uh, where this is uh, also also on the materialist level, often, uh, you know, something that's not been taken into account as much as it should be, I think. And then it's really about, okay, how, how are the structures that take up what's been uh, begun, yeah? Um, I mean, in the, in the case of the Houses of Dignity, <laughs> You know, it's the Catholic Church, which is interesting, yeah. but uh, but also, uh, yeah, and, uh, this is a question on so many levels, yeah, and how 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 we translate these fleeting moments of our interventions where a symbol becomes reality uh, into something that might link up with uh, a political movement and with other forces that are lay outside art, yeah. I think perhaps yeah, what I, I, we should learn, because one of the curators of this event, Kasia Wojcik, she gave me a book, uh, I think it was called Against Purity, that we have to learn that purity is not possible. So we can, for example, create houses of dignity to, to house people, that they get papers and go out of the circle of not having paper, not having housing, etc., so that they can be legalized. But you only can do it together with the Catholic Church because they have to pay for it, how it is now, you know, somehow. And then you are linked to an institution that you perhaps criticize partly. And 
I think what I learned uh, many times by working uh, in, in uh, I don't know, in, uh, as an artist, that purity is not existing. And that we have a lot of criticism in, in our times, I think, kind of measuring what we do with a dogma of purity that is not existing. That is just in reality, in real practice, is not existing. And this makes me sometimes very, very tired and very disappointed and very... Uh, it produces self-hatred somehow. Because you say you should do this act pure. You should do this act, you know, without depending from everything, without any negativity somehow. <laughs> but it's impossible. And how can you act with this, you know? And, I, uh, I think, and um, Milo, it's, it's something I, I deal with it from the very first day of, of my work. And uh, I, I can really feel the, this, the doubts and the pain by doing compromises when you work with an institution or a TV channel or whatever. And I think the only thing what we can do is uh, be liable, say, OK, this is the structure. We work with this or that partner. And uh, so this is the impact. And because of this, I had to do this. So I'm not a slave. I'm still an artist. But uh, to make it uh, transparent and to, to show this kind of transparency, what from my money, by if it's a Catholic church, if it's a TV station, if it's a producer, uh, we are in, in all these structures. Of course, we are from, from morning to night. And I would say two thirds of my energy is uh, tr trying to deal with these structures and to get the money and to make the decision. OK, I work for TV and I know the rules and they're, they're different than in TV and they're different in, in a theater, of course. But if I want to, to reach a lot of people uh, in a the theater, I reach maybe 1,000 uh, one evening and in uh, TV I reach whatever, 5 million. And uh, it's another institution, of course. And so let's talk about the structures and talk about our fights and talk yeah, about you know, our you failure. Know, absolutely. I know for me, the, 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 the thing that produces the most depression and self-hatred and, and the sleepless nights is, is less the TV station and the institution because I can accept. I can accept, you know, mm. this kind of contradiction on the meta level, I'm not really concerned because I really can change it uh, or only partly, but I inside the team, for example, inside how you work with people. As you say, you make kind of a deal and you say, okay, this is how you will be in that film and you try to find together a way, but perhaps it's not for yeah. you and not for the other person. You are sometimes, you are exploding and you have 500 points and you are only two people and sometimes you are two and you, you have even not one point, you know? So this kind of yeah. impurity of, of, of there is not always the mm -hmm. flow and the symbolic space because to make a symbolic action you need a lot of bureaucratic shit to do, you know? Or editing a film to have in the end this kind of, of reflective realism that you want to have, but it's completely constructed. So, I mean, and so on and so on and so on. So it's, 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 there are so many uh, sustainability, it's impossible. It's uh, somehow possible, but not, and so on. So I, yeah. Well, I would like to say there is also a connected side to it, what it produces. And um, the innocence of the viewer, the spectator, the audience also is no longer there, the purity. And that's a good thing. I think Heino Müller once good. said when he came to West Germany, he said, when I go through the uh, Fußgänger zone or the walking zone in Gelsenkirchen, everybody looks so innocent. I could scream. I cannot accept it. They are not innocent. Drama, no? Of course. And uh, and and I think the uh, what you do um, also in your work, that's the description of the violence of the Moscow trial, or whatever. The viewer himself or herself is all of a sudden looking very innocent. Is a participatory. Uh, element of it uh, is someone who has to question herself. I'm, what am I watching? What am I doing? Le Mosul play, you know, these things you did uh, there also, you know, so you went there shortly after the war. And uh, so you also produce something that no longer requests the purity of the Broadway show that we have here in New York, where nobody wants you to think about anything, you know, it's a, the exact opposite. So I think your work with all the complications and nightmares you have because of the internal struggles, but also producer that the audience member 
has to question himself, herself, and is part of that. And perhaps that is what the modern contemporary art also produces in a, uh, in, a, in, in a contrast to what there was before, where you were consuming one artwork, one painting, one sculpture, one film, and now it is, uh, is something where one is involved. Um, I don't know if you see this signal, uh, Frank. So we have the signal from our uh, curators that we have, I guess, now 15 minutes left. And we should come smoothly and slowly to an end. So I, I am sure you prepared, yeah. you prepared a kind of roundup. <laughs> 15 or five minutes? How many minutes? F 15, 15. So it's not 15. Yeah, no, maybe we should go to some audience questions. No, I have not round up. I don't know anything uh, more than anyone <laughs> else. I'm just learning with you guys. Maybe we should go to some audience questions. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can do that. There was one I remember uh, uh, asking about the difference, and I was I was when I was uh, thinking about impurity and the impossible of being innocent as a as a as a as an artist working in representation. There was something with Lacan eh? <laughs> that you have kind of reality always is the real, you know, that reality always is something. And 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 for example, if you describe violence or you produce violence together with your actors it's a violent moment you can't be in the moment of producing and filming violence you can't be in a brechtian distanciation you can add this distanciation later but not in the very moment i mean there's it's just like one little contradiction that i think in in uh, in, uh, in in the, in the current times is for many people uh, let's take the trick of warnings and everything a real problem that they can't take violence indirectly and there's something true in it and if you're in the representative arts as we all are we are tackling with this kind of 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 uh, how could we call it with this kind of sadism of representation that we uh, shoot on the innocence of the of the of the of the of the spectator that is not used to see uh, let's say the miserabilism is not used to see the structural violence, the racism, etc. For example, I had with Arte a very long discussion before we made the film, um, the new gospel, because there is a uh, um, the the <laughs> that's a very good question. I will come to it later. <laughs> <laughs> there is just another one. We have always projections of questions. Yes, like <laughs> <laughs> and there is a moment when, uh, in, a, in, a, in a casting, one actor coming to the casting is kind of torturing a chair for, for five minutes. And from a moment that you are understanding that this guy is taken by structural racism and that you are kind of impressed that he knows all this and you understand that I also would know all these words and all this violence when I would have to play a kind of a racist soldier because our culture knows. So he knows and I know. So that's no, it's not him individually. But at one point, this scene lo getting longer and longer falls into something else, which is kind of, a, of, a, of, a, of an aesthetic sad sadism. And then you're asking yourself, would you go there or wouldn't you go there? And I think that's a question we wouldn't have asked 20 years ago. So it's a very, very, it's a question of now, you know? Um, yes, voila. Uh, it's not really... Yeah, that's the... That's the uh, let, uh, let's yeah. be, be precise. Uh, what was your decision in this very moment? My decision How was I had to decide. No, it was a bit because they were asking me to cut it, so I didn't. Uh, it was more a kind of a father-son behavior. So, of course, then you are getting yeah. renitent when you should edit, but then you don't. But, I mean, I completely understood this argument, but I wanted to bring this structural racism to that point that it gets questionable as my act somehow, or as an act, a scene in the film that is quite fast edited, but here's a scene, it's the longest scene, three minutes. And everybody who watched because the the, for me the crucial point is who has the right of the last decision. Yeah, you can do it, you can provoke it, and who has in the very end who decides it's in the film or it's not in the film. So it's you, and <laughs> that's what, what I call transparency. Yeah, uh, you can 
be humble and say, no, be, I, I, I see it's a uh, provocation. I don't do it. But in the very end, it's you and it's me. So and I think we're, there is no democracy in art in the very end, because in this very last decision, if there is no institution, no Catholic church, no TV station, it's <laughs> you and it's me. We tell Katya to cut it out or to bring it in. Right. Yeah, yeah but so yeah, we are not yeah, pure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. That's that's impossible. That's impossible. That's true. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, at one moment you need a you need a you need a decision, and it depends from from yeah from from what you actually decide. Of course. Yeah, and that's the and most that's, of well, the that's times. That's why we to are liable. Honest, you you go into a a kind of a middle way, I would say, because it's collective, and then mm -hmm. we would like mm -hmm. kind of of find a way that everybody is d'accord, you know. So that's the. But can we can we uh, okay. go to the last? To yeah, maybe also like. Yeah. Uh, that I find this kind of uh, discussion that would be a very productive way of uh, of taking the current moment with the trigger warnings and so on and forth <laughs> up, namely in asking ourselves how are we invested in a history of violence that has always also been a history of aesthetic, what you call aesthetic violence, right? How how are we still like informed by it? Yeah? And to make that uh, uh, the kernel of the debate instead of, like sometimes it's done with the trigger warnings, instead of purifying the aesthetic realm as if, you know, the, uh, that's a bit to me as if bourgeois society would now create conditions under which it doesn't have to be confronted with its own history if of violence. Own yeah? Violence, absolutely. Yeah. It's so, only so it's, the elite that so want to be in a structural violent position without showing to the watching the face of this violence actually. Exactly. And so it's so the this micro decisions of, you know, how do we bring that in that we are really informed by that uh, history is I think uh, super important. And yeah. Yeah. So just to stress that. So that uh, one question for Juliane, I guess, at what point does the didacticism of these Lehrstücke produced by companies like IAPM drift into the pastoral? Uh, somebody is asking. So when is art, I mean, to perhaps translate it in the, in the terms we used, uh, when is the positivism of art really whipping out uh, the negative craziness of it? I mean, what is, the, what is the, the tipping point for you that you say, okay, that's not art anymore, that's kind of pure education of the masses? Uh, I can, uh, yeah, we'll <laughs> I <think> that <laughs> <laughs> Where do you stand on that? Uh, yeah, I would say if it's like uh, one can just ask the question, if there's nothing to a piece, and I think that somehow the Brechtian aesthetics is a good, uh, I always forget, is it point in case or case in point, whatever, <laughs> uh, um, that obviously there's more to it than the didacticism, yeah, uh, and uh, that one could... Uh, even say that you know these this idea is if some something coming together that in an instant uh, you can understand uh, uh, the conditions of uh, of society that this somehow um, multiplied in the or somehow self deconstructed in the way that Brecht's uh, plays were received uh, produced over and over again. Uh, and so on. So, uh, so that's a point, um, just structurally, uh, in the moment when there is uh, a production that would achieve the aim of just delivering a message, it would cease to be art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And fortunately, Brecht never achieved that. <laughs> he, went not, he was not Brecht <laughs> enough. So, <Yeah. laughs> well, uh, there are different strands in the Brecht. <laughs> Maybe at the very end, since the Moscow trial film is coming up, maybe say a few words to our viewers um, and uh, to people who want to see it who might not know about it. Um, also, you know, the people you encountered who now became uh, part of the news, you know. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the work. Yeah, I mean, the Moscow trials, that's a, a, a film or a, a performance we did in 2012-2013 in, in, uh, in Moscow. And um, it was uh, not a reenactment, but a, a kind of a restaging of three trials with the people involved. So trials against artists from the government of, of Putin at that time and still 
Um, so under the, let's say, under the alibi of offense to the religious feelings of people, he tried to whip out dissident artists or dissident exhibitions, um, namely in the Sakharov Center. So we restaged these trials, for example, against Pussy Riot um, uh, as the most known. This trial was only coming up during the preparation, so I knew them before that, and then it was made into a show trial, and we restaged these three trials with an open ending, with an independent jury, but following the Russian law, and we filmed everything what happened during, before, and after this, this artistic show trials. I, I, yeah, I, now I have really, uh, I have to announce uh, that at seven, this movie is uh, not on Facebook, like for example, this discussion, because then we, it seems that then we lose the rights to Facebook if we stream it there. So that's problematic. So if you want to see the film at seven now, you have to go on www.adk.de, www.adk.de, uh, the, the internet page of the Academy of the Arts in Berlin. And there the film is streamed. And of course, on the pages of all our friends, like, for example, the page of, uh, of the Siegel Center and, uh, and so on and so on, Schaubühne. And uh, after the film, we will have a discussion with uh, uh, Victoria Lomasco, uh, a Russian artist, uh, which was in the film. With Thomas Ostermeyer, we invited Kirill Serebrenikov. He has other problems now. Thomas Ostermeyer will, will somehow take his position as his very close uh, collaborator and friend from the Schaubühne, also a collaborator of this film. And uh, Sandra Frimmel, an art historian, uh, which was uh, included in the, in the film as one of the the dramaturgs of the film and the researchers will be here too. It will be uh, moderated by Florian Malzacher, um, a very good friend and uh, one of the most interesting theatre critics and, and writers and dramaturgs and curators of, uh, of Europe at that moment. Yeah. Well, so then, uh, wonderful. Thank you all. Thanks for the Academia Künste for hosting us again, uh, Milo, coming up with the idea and not just having the idea, putting it into motion and uh, having also an entire support system um, uh, to create it, but also to support your support system with the support system. So it is remarkable. It's truly, uh, um, uh, I think, a, a symbol and, and a representation of uh, what theater at the moment, so in contemporary theater, it's high philosophy of what it can be and perhaps what it should be and what is most needed. And it comes up now, it appears on the stage what you are doing. So it is totally connected to what you have. And yes, I think also it is part of a healing um, of the world and to, towards the healing of the world. And the, the global conscious you have truly is uh, so significant, and including the participatory aspect of the artists. There is uh, um, something that really should be taken very, very serious for everybody who studies theater, who produces theater, and who goes to the theater. So thank you all, and thanks, Andres, and, uh, and Rian, and everybody involved, the entire crew. Yeah, um, good healing, this Andres. Take care of your... Gute Besserung. Ja, gute Besserung. Ja, ja. Tschüss, vielen Dank, und ein, euch noch einen richtig Bye. guten Abend. Der Kampf geht weiter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Frank. Tschüss. Tschüss. Yeah, yeah. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.